Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm David Gersten. I'm the director of Arts Letters and Numbers. And I want to welcome uh, you all to today's conversation with Lisa Landrum and Tracy Eve Winton. Um, and this uh, talk is titled Heuristic Pedagogy and Dramatic Discovery. And it's part of an ongoing series of projects titled Theaters of Arch Imagination um, that Lisa has put together as part of uh, our Sunship exhibition in the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. And I really, I really want to take a moment to thank Lisa Landrum so much for, for putting all of this together. This series has been incredible. There's more to come. Um, but just bringing so much to this exhibition, I really love these uh, projects. So thank you. Lisa. Um, and I want to welcome and, and thank uh, Tracy Eve Winton for joining us today. It's great to see you again, Tracy. Um, and it is a real honor to have you here. Um, so I'm going to very briefly uh, introduce Lisa and Tracy, and then I will hand it over to Lisa to begin uh, the program. Uh, Lisa Landrum is an educator, architect, scholar, and creative researcher dedicated to advancing social justice, cultural meaning, and mythopoetic imagination. She is the Associate Dean of Research and Associate Professor in the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. Tracy E. Winton is an architectural historian, scholar, artist, and educator, currently Associate Professor at the Waterloo, where she led the study abroad program in Rome for many years uh, and created several experimental theater productions with her architecture students. Uh, she has numerous publications on material imagination and is currently writing a book about the language of modern architecture in Carlos Scarpa's Castel Vicio Museum. So I am so moved and thankful that we can have this conversation today. Uh, and at the end of the conversation, we will have time for some questions and, and conversation. So thank you everybody for coming and I'll pass it over to Lisa to begin the program. All right, well, thank you very much, David. And thank you also to the entire Arts Letters and Numbers team uh, for the generous support and for the invitation to participate in this pretty incredible sonship, the sonship of friendship, as we like to call it from the start, which is helping all of us reconceive architecture as a life-sustaining discipline. So before we get into the main program, I am going to give a little summary of the overall uh, ARC Imagination series that this is part of. So when you visit the Sunship website, you'll see that this ARC is configured as a labyrinth, a labyrinth of interconnected houses for film exhibitions, public gatherings, music, conversations, and material imagination, where I think we are assembled today for this exchange on your heuristic pedagogy and dramatic discovery with myself, Tracy Steve Winton, and also a current and recent student who I'll introduce in a moment. So today's exchange is act four of a five act series exploring dramatic modes of architectural imagination in ways that intersect the central Biennale theme of how will we live together. Now, one way we will live together is by renewed forms of collaboration, which uh, the Arts Letters and Numbers team is modeling through creative teamwork of a dispersed crew working from Hangzhou, Tehran, Athens, New York, and supporting many other global simpaticos in this common quest to reinvigorate social contracts. So I'm pleased to join this initiative from Winnipeg at the center of Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, and these are the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation. And one way that we will uh, live together in Canada is by acknowledging the injustices of colonial violence and committing ourselves to truth, reconciliation, and partnership with Indigenous communities moving forward. So for architects, the question of living together is not simply a problem of building better, but an ethical and poetic challenge of imagining deeper, imagining in more fulsome, complicated, and profound ways. So this event, as I've said, is one of five uh, acts probing fundamental modes of architectural imagination by integrating 
sonic, mythic, poetic, heuristic, and dramatic arts. And, you know, I like to think about these as, as, you know, truly fundamental. This is kind of, you know, if you take away the various technologies and software, we're sort of returning here to embodied experiment, experiential and narrative modes, where we have our corporeal selves, our language, our gesture, our gestures, our shared human cosmos, and our involvement in a more than human world. So uh, I'll just very briefly review the previous acts in this series. Act one in this series was Sonic Trails, a multimedia installation by Max and Orian Sandrid, which was live streamed to the Sunship for 101 hours. Uh, so this work turned to take a look at the city in the crisis of lockdown and integrated visual and audio recordings uh, like these. <laughs> So integrating sounds of things like traffic lights, the persistent movement of exhaust fans, also slow moving trains, uh, traffic and lawn sprinklers. Uh, the, the team integrated these sounds and sights and reconfigured them to, to point to the kind of poetic pulse of these prosaic rhythms. And all of these environmental sounds and sights were configured for embodied experience in the gallery at our school, maintaining this tension between absence and presence, abstraction and embodiment. So act two in this series was entitled Ba, Indonesian for deluge. And this was a fusion of flood myths to rebuild a kind of cosmic arc. It interweaves flood myths from multiple cultures, including Sumerian, Hindu, Judeo-Christian, Arabic, Norse, Nigerian, Filipino, Chinese, and indigenous sources into one tale, imploring all of us to care for one another and Mother Earth. And here is a taste of that. Obatala was the god of the Babylonian flood story was found in Africa. And the great of Muppet New Orleans relates to Noah's Ark. And it was all different animals trying to fish into the jar of water. But then the fish started growing, and the jar was not big enough for it. So this work was created by Andrea Lange, Seeds Motion, and a crew of global storytellers with the premise that sharing stories may be one of our best strategies for surviving our flood of contemporary crises. And I think this interweaving of multiple stories and the narrative uh, will touch on one of our themes that we get into with Tracy of the collective intelligence or collective agency. So act three in this Arc Imagination series immersed us in the invisible theater of Grant Guy and the archie poetry of Ted Landrum, portions of which were recorded in the immersive environment of sonic trails with newly composed works created in direct response to the sunship provocations and recordings of all three of these um, first three acts, the conversations, you'll find them on the Arts Letters and Numbers website. So we will conclude this five act series next Saturday with the Winnipeg based theater group End of the West, and they will take us backstage into the process of devising Janus, the personification of thresh thresholds. And this is a new uh, dramatic work which premieres in person in Winnipeg on December 2nd. And we're going to go backstage with them to talk about the devising process, which is intercultural and and uh, interdisciplinary. But today, Act Four, we are seeking the eureka of theatrical arts in architectural education. So I am going to stop with this, and I think we can bring uh, Tracy as well as Sean and Alexa into the spotlight. There we go. Um, so Tracy, as as David. Uh, said already is a is a professor of architecture at the University of Waterloo and a scholar extraordinaire of all things intersecting the material imagination. She studied like I did with Alberto Perez Gomez, who is on the call. Thank you, Alberto, for coming, as well as Dalibor Vesley. Um, and Tracy and I have interacted on this topic of dramatic arts and education for many years, actually going back 10 years ago. I wish we had a Zoom conversation of 
a Zoom recording of that conversation we had, Tracy, 10 years ago at that conference <laughs> when we sure first shared these stories about Cyclops and how you were integrating these amazing things into your, into your teaching. Um, so, but we're also joined on the call here uh, uh, by a recent graduate, well, actually not so recent, Sean, I think you graduated in 2011. No, no, that's uh, 2019. Oh, 2019. It's all just yesterday for me, yeah. but yeah, to 2019. <laughs> that is recent, that, but that was pre-pandemic in a way that's eons ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Sean Maciel is a, so he's a graduate from the University of Waterloo. He participated with, with Tracy in one of the theater productions. And he's also a freelance writer based in Cambridge, Ontario, uh, where he also runs Red Brick, a graphic design business. And he is a textile artist and an amateur magician. I, maybe we yep, will see no. a trick. Uh, okay. <laughs> And Alixa Lacerna is a Master of Architecture student at the University of Manitoba. She is co-president of the University of Manitoba Association of Architecture Students. She is co-founder of a podcast tackling issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion in Winnipeg's design scene entitled Jar Opener. And this jar was just opened on Instagram last night. Thank you, Alixa, for all of your advocacy in this area. Uh, she is pursuing an architecture of healing and mindfulness while empowering many ways to be an architect. And she's, collaborate, she's been collaborating with me and a team of students um, for at least the last year uh, in, in various ways on the theaters of architectural imagination projects. So thank you very much, Alexa, for joining. Okay, so we are we we sketched a a uh, scaffold to our conversation and what we are going to do is uh, Tracy and I are going to set the stage by sharing some pedagogical examples and also precedents and influences on the way that we have integrated uh, drama into our teaching and then each of these segments are going to be um, animated by some interjections questions thoughts diversions by Sean and Alexa and at any point in the conversation we welcome comments in the chat as well uh, so Tracy I will turn things over to you uh, to tell us about yeah Tracy how have you involved theatrical arts and architectural education well, um, first of all, I just want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Lisa, for your amazing work. And I also want to thank uh, David and the whole Arts Letters and Numbers team for setting this up, uh, this, this kind of a great conversation. I'm going to just uh, share some slides with everybody here. And um, so, you know, the question of how theater enters our lives. I, I feel that theater is very strongly connected to the city. And of course, there are, there are some exceptions to that. And, and we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, probably gonna get into a lot of those exceptions, but I was lucky enough to live for many years in Rome and uh, travel around Italy with my students and begin to see, you know, a very close relationship between manifestations of this, of you know, manifestations of the theater, the way that it sort of played out in everyday life, uh, in in different cities, and you know, so like I'm really talking a lot about the Italian context here because this is this is what I know, um, but I think there's also a little bit of a kind of a a universal that we can draw out of that um, in terms of how public space is used, the relationship, the kind of visual and physical relationships. Um, you know, within especially the kind of traditional fabric of the city, you know, the, the kind of scale here, you're actually seeing an, an image of a of one of the Roman gates of Verona. Um, but, you know, over the years, all kinds of things have entered into it, you know, like um, Piranesi, the various plays that I've done, um, thinking about how we reenact histories or stories, like how do we kind of reinterpret things every year, um, every generation. Um, Rome is amazing for looking at public space in a very theatrical way, which comes a lot out of its, its sort of Baroque history as well. 
Um, you also find like here, you can even see um, the balconies, which make us all think of, of Shakespeare um, and which bring people onto the street in a way that begins to inform how theaters were built starting uh, back in the Renaissance. So I began to teach um, theater in a cultural history course that we have at the University of Waterloo. And the School of Architecture there was founded by a cultural historian who was actually a, a scholar of medieval theater, not an architect. Um, and he believed very strongly that cultural history was a necessity for architects to study in order not only that they be cultural, but also that they become good citizens, that they actually think about social and political issues as well. And, but by the time I started teaching, um, the play had sort of survived, but it had become a kind of a, a light entertainment. It wasn't really pedagogical. And I thought, well, you know, this could be a kind of a missed opportunity. So let's see how we can use a theater project to really push the envelope for design thinking, but also for community thinking. Like how can we sort of, how can we work in different ways? Like how can this become a kind of a studio environment for exploring a lot of ideas? And so we started to make links uh, between, you know, the hi history, which was the topic and the imagination, which is the kind of creative part. Um, and, you know, there were lots of precedents. The Bauhaus had started uh, with a theater program that later became an architecture program. And there's so much common ground with architecture. And, um, you know, architecture and theater both have these kind of large crews that become sort of increasingly specialized, which have to work together towards a common goal. And sometimes, you know, when we working in the profession, we don't see that as much because there's a kind of a top-down hierarchy or there's other structures in place that, that don't allow for this kind of uh, fertile exploration. So between um, 2006 and 2019, when we were shut down by the pandemic, I did 11 collaborative experimental plays and one alternate reality game. That's a topic for another day. Um, each of which basically involved 70 or 80 second year architecture students and um, working collaboratively, working in found spaces. And the students created the whole event. Um, so our students are architects and they're not professional actors. And I decided to sort of to, to take the cultural history ideas and to begin to look more closely at those, not to really mimic uh, sort of ordinary ordinary plays and theater, like, you know, they're not professional actors. So we moved away from realist dialogue using more kind of poetic expressions, using uh, verbalizations more sort of express, expressively, looking at things like placemaking, moving bodies in space, like choreography, martial arts, atmospheres, uh, how you would use or adapt an existing space or in, in when working in landscapes, you would use framing, sort of redirecting attention to existing qualities. And so the students would self-organize the beginning of the term into subgroups that had titles like art and set or music and sound um, and begin to collectively develop a vision and using a lot of historical research, but what they were making was always a contemporary interpretation. So, you know, using the tools at hand, you know, like what we had, what the materials at hand, um, which included the way that we're looking at the site. Um, and the idea being that we continually renew history and tradition. We're always interpreting um, and recreating it in the present. And I think this is important when we think about tradition, because we often think about that as something that's kind of like set in stone, but it isn't. Um, we're always making over reality and we construct memory as a kind of a story um, and history by analogy. And that's one of the themes we actually look at is the construction of memory. And it's kind of a tectonic process where you have parts uh, that have to be held together in a whole and the better they hold together, the more kind of 
vital it is. Um, and, and one of the wonderful, you know, sort of analogies we have for this, thing, which has, you know, which is about the whole thing, but it's also about the objects, um, goes back to Daedalus, mythology's first architect, and the Daedalon, which I know Lisa's also going to talk about, we're both going to talk about this, which is this cunningly wrought composite object. And we first explored this um, in 2008 with, with Cora. You have this, uh, the photo that you're seeing here. Um, Cora, Daedalus in the Labyrinth was the title of this play. And uh, we, so we looked at the, you know, how you make things according to sets and costumes and props. And so, you know, the students had basically designed uh, and made everything here that you're seeing. I mean, it's a little bit blurry, but basically designed all the sets, which were basically five stages within this huge multi-story uh, furniture showroom that also had um, a basement with a huge labyrinth that we also built um, that was accessed by a, a broken escalator. And so this was, uh, you know, it was kind of a test case for making things and understanding the possibilities in all of these categories, props, you know, specialized objects like Daedala, uh, the sets, the costumes, and again, uh, live music and other, uh, other aspects of the production. So, so we were always thinking about this question of harmony amongst parts and, and perfect harmony amongst body parts, which we know gives rise to animation, this life force. And, and uh, so we looked at that in Cora, in Athru, in, in Erebus and Terror, um, and we'll come back to this, I know, a little bit later. Um, and starting with stories, the writing team would develop the story into a script and the sound team would compose an original musical score. And we always had musicians in the class who were playing live. Um, and, and this was all kind of cemented by the idea of place, a city, a site, a spatial situation, which would give us uh, the stability to develop temporal depth and convergences of characters and, and, and things, objects and atmosphere, all sort of deepened by these multiple elements at various scales on stage and, and off stage. Um, here's Ilion, where we combined Homer's Iliad with uh, a Renaissance story from Politiano of the blinding of Homer. Um, this is what got, Sean was part of this. Um, and, and the modern history of archeology span with Schliemann's search for the side of Troy. So we sort of had these, these, these three different stories that were being woven together um, including Schliemann's uh, sort of historical quest, where he intuits uh, by the end that, you know, which is what we all learn in the audience, so that history is not gone with the past. It remains present around us, forming us and vice versa. And of course, it, it must be grasped in that moment when it flashes up for you. I had to include this because Lisa and I, our first conversation, which was like 10 or 11 years ago, uh, we talked about the Cyclops and Satyr drama. This was like how we bonded. Uh, and we've been friends ever since. Um, and so, you know, the Cyclops was the, the only Satyr play that survived antiquity. And Odysseus uh, also represents one of my favorite themes, which is the unreliable narrator a storyteller character that, that basically thematizes the power of art in the fictive world. So the whole story might just be one of his tales, like a big fabrication. Um, and this is a theme that also kind of carried on to some of the other plays where we looked at the status of art and reality and the, maybe the kind of interpenetration, the sort of sharing of qualities and then the way that that, that sort of plays out in dreams or afterlives or visions. Um, games and so on. Um, in Ecstasis, we uh, adapted the Bacchae by Euripides. And this was staged, again, we, all of our spaces were kind of found this one. We actually used the School of Architecture to sort of layer these uh, events in the city of Thebes. 
over the School of Architecture's different spaces and circulation spaces. Um, Muse, again, uh, used the, the part of the uh, architecture school. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll come back to some of these, but uh, this was a play we did about uh, Antonin Artaud and Jacques Lacan. Um, and the last play that we did, Leviathan, which was a play that was really about language and humanity. Um, I'm gonna hand this back over to Lisa. Wow, Tracy, I feel like we're we're only getting going, but I think we'll we'll return to some of these images. Um, okay, so that's incredible. And by comparison, the examples that I'm going to share are of a much smaller scale <laughs> and maybe some more uh, variegated approaches. Um, yeah, because the, the the story of the cultural history program is is a is a beautiful one that sets up the apparatus for for the works that you've done, Tracy. Okay, let me get this going. Okay, so the bits that I will share, as I said, are, are a bit more variegated. The pictures are not as compelling. Um, but what I'm showing here is a course outline for a seminar that I del delivered at Norwich University in 2006. This was, um, I had taught a couple years previous before this to this, but this was the first time where I had the option of delivering a kind of option-based immersive seminar where I could integrate material that I was currently working on in my PhD at the time, which included a very close analysis of Euripides Cyclops, where Odysseus is referred to as an architect. So I was deep into my PhD studies and, and luckily had a group of very keen students at this small university who were on board with me to play with the material. So the premise of this seminar was to have the students, you know, study particular architects of the past, but mythic, legendary, and fictional architects, but not simply study them. They, in a way, became understudies to them and embodied them. So the point was not just to look at the architects, but to, in a sense, become the architect. And in the examples that I'm sharing, it they're taking the pedagogical situation of, this, in this case, the seminar, but also the studio, and symposiums, they're taking those situations as inherently theatrical, you know, inherently theatrical. The, the, the seminar, like the studio, you have a group of keen individuals coming to the table, coming to that space with the anticipation of enacting transformation and of allowing themselves to be transformed. This is, you know, the kind of the pedagogical contract, you are willing, you, you, you suspend this willing, you have this willing suspension of disbelief, you allow yourself to be transformed, and you are expect to enact transformation. So in this seminar, this was part of the course outline, <laughs> using a clip from Julie Taymor's Fool's Fire and snippets of the architects, which, which were under study in the course, uh, through primary sources, through literary works like Ovid and Homer, but also excerpts from uh, various architects treatises. So it was a, a, the goal was to make history present, as Tracy already alluded to, through this kind of embodiment of the persona in, in, in histrionics, uh, which the origin of the word really means interpreter. You know, the actor is an interpreter of the, of the character that they make present, that they embody. So this seminar, each session, it was like a, in our curriculum, it's equivalent to a three credit course. We met once a week for a full term. The first um, thing we did each time we met is we adjusted the space. We, we didn't, in this case, have the privilege of working in found industrial spaces, but we had the space itself, which was relatively generic, although we were actually um, uh, working at a former Carnegie Library, <laughs> which was itself interesting. But there was these large wooden tables. The first thing we did every day is we 
turned the tables. <laughs> we adjusted the, the room and in doing so disrupted the hierarchies of expectation of, you know, who is teacher, who is student, what is the, the configuration of learning. So we sort of sought this renewed configuration of learning by adjusting the furniture, adjusting the space. And this was day one. It was kind of cool, you know, go in, you know, sit at the seminar table. No, we're going to flip the seminar tables on their head. So this created other ways ways of learning you know we were sitting on the floor I bought carpets for this space <laughs> we configured on the on the floor as a kind of Peter Brookian uh, space of, of inclusion and also transformation but in a way that was always trying to keep present these these architect figures who were we were reading about from primary sources and using those primary sources to develop scripts uh, so the students were there were readings I actually worked pretty hard to find the juiciest bits of all of these primary sources to um, you know ignite the students imagination we we experimented we used the pedestals from the school that were typically used for models and turned them into kind of a cafe like environment for breakout sessions uh, we rotated the groups we sort of were finding the synergies between the dialogues between the snippets between the students interests uh, and every session i would come to the class with with new kinds of um, uh, experiments involving props, involving stage directions, um, and, and we invented a, a set of, uh, we used the apparatus of theatre production to create not essays on the architects, but invented dialogues of the architects talking to one another. So, you know, there's uh, nine students and they embodied Imhotep, Eupolinos, a master mason, Daedalus, Palestro, which is a character from uh, uh, ancient Latin comedy, uh, but referred to as an architect, a cunning architect figure, Lepidus, which is the kind of alter ego of Leon Battista Alberti in the Renaissance, uh, Aaron, who is a character in a Shakespeare play, but also has biblical origins in the, in the agencies of making, Trophonius, this amazing kooky uh, oracle architect, and Prometheus, who really kind of embodies uh, many of the dilemmas. So each of the, the um, dialogues also had a dilemma, a kind of crisis that the students were discussing. So the performance was in the main entry space of the architecture school. It's pretty modest, uh, really, but Again, this all like every class was a rehearsal uh, where we tested what was available in the school, just making use of the atrium, all of these pedestals that were available. And depending, of course, on how you use it, you know, here's Prometheus, that pile of pedestals becomes the rocky crag against which he is tethered. Um, and really kind of simple, simple, but you know, I think in some ways profound transformations took place. And, and, and this is a theme we're going to continue with is, you know, the primacy of, of metaphor, transformation, but dramatic metaphor, where it's not just a simply a, a, a mapping of this onto that, but something, there is an event, something transp transpires, and something is discovered in that transformation. So for instance, this red curtain, which in a way is just sort of setting the stage, it's a kind of curtain, it's a focus, it's also in a sense a stream of blood for one of the stories that Aaron tells. But then at a certain moment, you know, we lifted it up and it becomes the regal cape of this character, and it transforms the status, and it transforms this piece of set into a piece of costume, but that costume is profoundly symbolic and it changes the space. Another example of, of this kind of transformation is from this character, Gavin. Oh my gosh, he was a natural. He was playing Daedalus with um, this orange boa around his neck. And he was up there with his script and rehearsing bits of his line. And he's telling the story of, of he's enacting stories from Daedalus and Icarus, you know, the fall of Icarus, how to make present the fall of Icarus. And with a, a gesture, you know, he flicked his script forward and it fluttered down to the ground and this, you know, embodies the fall of Icarus. So this is this, these kinds of dramatic metaphors are discovered in the act of rehearsal. But just as important as these kind of situational transformations are the transformations of individuals themselves, right? I mean, everyone in their 20 something years are, are becoming <laughs> 
I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the agent that they wish to become, as we all are through our entire lives, but there's something about this, this event of becoming that the costume sort of lets loose an aspect of oneself, which one is reaching for. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very, you know, it allows it allows individuals to be otherwise, to act otherwise, to imagine otherwise. And the costume had a, a big part of this. There's a degree of risk, but also incredibly liberating if the space is set up in a way that is that is trusting. So I've brought these uh, these aspects into my teaching in more modest ways more recently through, you know, creating montages of architect figures composed of, of multiple um, images, kind of hybrid characterizations of the architect, also by involving um, dialogue forms in essay, instead of essay writing and history and theory curriculum. And then in the studio environment, you know, looking to the studio itself as a site of transformation, as a theatrical event. So this project from just a couple of years ago, Studio Theater, we took the desk top as a stage of making and every student transformed that desk space into a miniature theater through you know various influences the student was studying Appia, uh, Adolf Appia uh, lighting conditions. Um, every student was studying a particular theatrical device, uh, which is in itself a kind of backstage device, a device of architectural imagination. But this transformation, realizing that that our space, our space of enactment, our space of representation is a kind of theatrical projection, a rehearsal scenario, but something that enacts, um, taking the raked stage of the drafting board as a kind of a theatrical rake stage here, um, projections by Matt Radchford which um, set up a theater proposition for the city. Uh, Claire Spearman here was looking at uh, the proscenium in the theater. Uh, this is what I have behind me as my backdrop. It's a planned view of her desk and an elevational view of her of her space. Uh, and there she is within the space. So realizing that, you know, what we do as architects in the in the process of creation is itself a kind of performative, inactive event. You know, when we give presentations, we are we are seeking to persuade, and one of the most important individuals to persuade is oneself, <laughs> which one does through taking on various guises and, and hesitations and questioning, uh, but, but taking the pedagogical scenario as uh, dramatic in itself, and of course, placing oneself in the space of making as, an, as a kind of impresario, but one which recedes in order to let other events come forward. This is Abel, and he had been looking at the Duzek Machina as a stage device and created a machine within his um, a kind of crane within his studio space to move between his different platforms of making. But it's not just the individual in their space of making, it's a collective. And every time we gather for a studio conversation, there is a kind of audience of spectators participating in that event. So this participatory dimension is something I've, I've taken into other modes of, of teaching and collaboration and advocacy work. This is a block course I taught at the University of Calgary with uh, Chris Kelly just before the pandemic, the days before the pandemic in March of 2020, uh, seeking social innovation, mask making. Um, these students were participating in the Canadian architecture forums and education. They were going to be table captains for an important consultation discussion. We thought, well, in order to do that well, one really needs to get out of one shell and, you know, do some dancing and advocacy in the city. So this mask making, uh, it posed a question of, I am the one who... I am the one who, and then in order to complete that sentence, each student was tasked with the invention of a mask instead of gestures. Um, moving into the our pandemic area, this is a seminar I taught uh, last fall, fall of 2020, Alexa was in this seminar. And Alexa, I realize I don't have you in this picture because if you recall, we were trying to, to still be in the same space, even though we were all in separate spaces. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we all share, we were all trying to put ourselves into the same black box theater by sharing the same black background. But poor Alexa, her s operating system didn't allow for virtual backdrops. And she was busy trying to put herself underneath her desk with various blankets and <laughs> 
which actually is the, one of the most theatrical of all of the actions. I, sh I should have put that picture in here. But nevertheless, in this seminar, which is not the way I expect it to deliver the seminar, of course, we worked within the limitations uh, to, 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 to see how we could try to put ourselves in the shared space. Um, uh, and students studied um, various performance artists paired up with, with architects whose work is performative. And then out of those studies and seminar discussions, uh, each student created uh, animated, uh, a short animated video based on those studies in their own space. And these were quite uh, provocative looking at various representational acts. Um, Jonathan Lum there is, is kind of amazing, filmed himself three times in three three personas uh, looking at the dialogue. Um, Zara, the bottom right there with clips from her from her hometown of Yaz. Um, so th these were, I mean, these are films, these are animations. And I think this is a question that Sean uh, posed to us in our preparatory conversations about how is the theater different from cinematic arts. Um, but all of that work in the seminar and all of what, what has happened this summer was preparation for a symposium, which um, I co-chaired together with Sam Ridgway and Alberto Perez Gomez and Louise Peltier were involved in this this past May uh, in honor of Marco Fiscari, Theatres of Architectural Imagination. Tracy was a presenter at this symposium. Of course, it was supposed to be in person uh, with an in-person exhibition, but instead we had an exhibition of entreacts with submissions uh, from around the world. World. And this montage was made by, uh, by Max Sandrid and other students also participated in this exhibition. So I think this is raising questions for us about modes of embodied engagement in this uh, in ways that we are separated. And this entire series of putting together this arc imagination uh, set of events is another form of theatrical collaboration, uh, which manifests as exhibitions and online events. But in fact, there were some in-person components and there was our entire set of weekly meetings over the summer, uh, which were very meaningful and which in a way also embodied this, the, treating the pedagogical uh, exchanges in the symposium seminar in studio, studio as inherently theatrical. So I am going to stop there and um, Sean and Alexa, maybe you have a, a follow up comment or question for us. <laughs> um, yeah, I can go first. Uh, so there's, th especially with, um, I mean, I'm mostly familiar with Tracy's work, Lisa, it's been fascinating to see how your work has developed. Um, but as a kind of connection between the two of you, um, your early work was focused on the, the historic figures and bringing them together. And I know from experience, much of Tracy's work is sort of a, like a layering of sources as I think she's described already. Um, you know, the, the uh, Franklin expedition layered on top of Frankenstein, uh, for instance. And uh, I'm just think it would be interesting if you, uh, you know, took the time to kind of discuss how you settle on that, like how you pick those and collect them and uh, present those to students as a sort of series of layers to be engaged with. Um, yeah. Lisa, do you want to Oh, you you go ahead, Tracy. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought Sean was actually asking you this question, so it's my mistake. I um, it was both. Uh, okay, um, I don't mind uh, going first. I I was going to say that um, it it takes a kind of a it takes a bit of sort of preliminary digging to come up with. Uh, story material and I think that we all we all kind of love a good story and we know a good story when we hear it um, but what I started to do was to look for um, to look for different stories that had a kind of a that would give us a kind of an amplified temporality um, but were anchored together by consistency in a place and consistency in a place is something that I learned from Vim Vendors. Like if you watch Wings of Desire, you understand that not only the story that he's telling on the screen, but also the hundreds of stories that the angels are hearing are anchored together 
by the city of Berlin in, in all of its ages, basically, in all of its guises and all of its kind of mutations. Um, and I think that, that that was a very sort of important uh, sort of model for me to begin to understand, because of course, one of the things we're so interested in is like, what is place? How do we, you know, what is place making? How do we understand the kind of complexities, um, you know, that, that, that it's a kind of, that it's something that the soul makes for storing memories, that it's something that we share and, and which communicates. And so, um, you know, in a couple of instances, Sean was mentioning, uh, the Franklin expedition, which was actually, um, you know, it w well, which in which the two ships, Erebus and Terror, uh, were lost and disappeared, and they recently found one of them. But when we did it, it there was it was still a kind of a historical mystery. But when I I reread Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and realized that the entire story takes place in the sublime landscape of the Canadian Arctic. And is told actually, uh, in fact, on board a ship. And I thought, God, there's like an amazing moment when these two stories collide. Um, and what happens? Because it's the kind of friction of fragments, right? It's kind of collage strategy. It goes very, it, it goes very much with like, how do we construct, you know, how do we construct history? We construct it from like pieces that we know and find that are kind of witnesses or evidence um but we also tell a story and uh, it, it's a you know freud talks about this also in his interpretation of dreams like how do you put together fragments um that gives these sort of disconnected pieces a semblance um of coherence um well we sort of we add these bits and pieces in and we create a narrative and narrative is good because it's very easy to remember things but when they have a kind of causal narrative sequences. Uh, so this is partly, you know, what what we've been doing in, in, in that and in, in, in Erebus and Terror and Elyon, um, looking at these sort of like constructions that are also like analogous to the physical ones. That's great. And, and for me, the, the thread that connects the sources together is, well, especially for the early pieces, it's usually the architect figure. Um, so looking at uh, works of, of early drama and literature where the word architect is used figuratively, um, usually attributed to the protagonist in that story, but in various ways. So I was tracking all of these through my, my PhD research and finding some pretty interesting scenarios. So that was the thread that brought together, of course, figures like Daedalus and Trophonius, but also uh, more outliers in the uh, uh, early Greek plays, including a protagonist named Trugaios, who is a kind of farmer <laughs> figure in Aristophanes' piece, Odysseus, who is referred to as an architect in Euripides' Cyclops, and then these early Latin plays by, by Plautus. Uh, there's five characters in there referred to as an architect, and these are all like cunning slave characters in these very early Latin dramas, uh, two centuries before Vitruvius. And then I track this through other other plays throughout history and wove together various fictions. So those became the, the, the set of texts and then they were often riffed off of more, you know, mainstream architectural history. So works like Leon Battista Alberti, but looking at his fictional pieces and pieces in plays in, instead of, well, augmenting the, the work on De Edificatoria, the art of building. But that's great. Thanks, Sean. Um, should, should we move forward with the next section or? Yeah, okay. So then I think um, uh, the, the next framing part of our discussion will be like, where is all of this coming from? And we've already touched on this, but I think Tracy and I now are going to share some precedents and motives uh, for the work. So Tracy, over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so, yeah, so one of the questions that came up when we were thinking about this was, you know, what leads, what leads you to theater? Like, what's this big interest in theater and architecture and what kind of precedents are, are like coming up for us? And um, 
you know, so basically, like for me, and I'm not really theorizing, like I don't really theorize here, but but theater is a kind of embodied storytelling. And and it's something that that what's important is that it's the way that it's uniquely able to dramatize multiple viewpoints um, and to hold those things in tension without flattening them or allowing sort of one side or the other to kind of collapse into, uh, you know, to sort of like a single narrative. And so this, these tensions that are inherent in the idea of complexity, which I think today is really an important um, idea. And that's also connected to what we're also going to talk about this idea of collective intelligence. But, um, you know, theater has this long history, as I mentioned, of being interwoven with the city. So I'm just going to show like a couple of slides um, here that sort of maybe like bring, uh, for me, sort of bring up the, the kind of key ideas. And, and one of them is, uh, I, I can relate this very nicely back to the to uh, Lisa's theatrical performance that she showed with the big red curtain, which is just beautiful. Like that's just amazing, sort of thinking about the mapping of one space onto another, the idea of metaphorical space, which is a kind of also a bit of, but underused these days in the way that we are able to understand what it really means to be in one space, but to have a sensibility of being in another. It's a bit like the face and the face with a mask. Um, but this is the Campo in Siena, which of course is represented best in a painting because photos can't give you all the pieces that you need. Um, and the Campo in Siena is basically a huge theater. The Palazzo Publico, which itself contains a kind of manifesto about the ideal city uh, on the inside, uh, the, the famous Lorenzetti frescoes, um, so the Palazzo Publico plays the part of the Francina, the architectural wall, the scenic backdrop, and it has wings on either side. And then the surface of the piazza, which slopes up, is a lot like a Roman cave, with, of course, the buildings around it, the real windows that face onto the scene. And then um, for anyone who's ever climbed them, the stairs and passages that move through between the buildings to disgorge spectators like, like the Roman vomitoria, which you would have, for example, in the Colosseum. So, you know, theater is this, this guiding metaphor for public space. It speaks about the importance of embodiment um, and also to the kind of multiplicity uh, and of characteristics um, that you can sort of experience when those two registers of where I where I am and where I think I am are layered one on top of another. And so there's a lot of, you know, so we actually get that a lot when you start looking at, at, at sort of Renaissance theaters, I think, for example, um, of, of this, which is the tiny little theater in Sabianetta, um, in which and I mean, the, the set is not original, but um, what's really interesting and nobody ever photographs are these two frescoes on either side, um, which are placing you as you stand there between them are placing you precisely in the uh, eternal city of Rome, you know? So it's, it's like a little manifesto there that's again about the uh, sort of just bringing forward the topic of metaphorical space um, and how that works in the theater, but it's actually being done in the real space and, the, and the, that the spectators, the audience are sitting in and, and you're actually kind of understanding that as you're, as you're sitting there. We have, um, I, th I think I could just give a couple more examples of things that we look at. We, uh, one thing I love is uh, Serlio's, you know, famous images of, of the three scenes. I only put two up because I've talked about the tragic scene enough. Uh, but we have the comic and the satiric scene. So the tragic scene is basically in uh, the kind of civic space um, of, the, of the city. And the comic scene is, is set amongst private dwellings, so like public and private. And the satiric scene is, you know, which Lisa and I talked about, is, is out in the countryside. It's sort of outside of the bounds of civilization. And, uh, you know, so when you get Roman... Uh, different, you know, different Roman cities would begin to 
reference back to Rome as the ideal city. And when they were building theaters or people were painting uh, sort of like, so all these other artifacts which are connected are always pointing back to this real reciprocity between the ideal city uh, and the theater. And, and it's, so it's not at all obvious until you start to actually examine the, you know, the evidence you find uh, sites of all kinds. Here's a, just another shot of Verona with its balconies. Um, and then outside of the realm of the city, but just outside in, in order to make that break. You know, if you go in Vicenza, which of course is famous for the, for its Palladian buildings, including the uh, Olympic theater, Teatro Olimpico, um, with its with its famous sets, you you go up the hill to the Villa Rotonda, where if you were to stand on this satyr mask and set into the exact center of the Villa Rotonda, um, you would have a perfect vision of these, you know, these beautifully framed kind of prosceniumed uh, scenes of the countryside. For you know, of course, if you go there today, it's probably it's not exactly identical to how it was in, in the end of the 16th century, but it's you still understand that the satiric scene is something where you actually you actually are the one that's doing the rotating, and what happens outside, um, which might actually just be happenstance and kind of randomness. You know, you would see some kind of fetching image um, of a landscape or a scene um, in the rural space. Um, I also wanted to mention just super briefly, I got very interested in, um, I got interested in uh, Antonin Artaud, but, but primarily because I, I was fascinated by non-Western performance traditions and how they might be related to architecture. And of course, Artaud is really important for Western theater because he changed Basically, he sort of like, not in his practice, but in his writings, he changed the way that we understood what theater could really be in a way that's much more interesting for us as architects. So he was shifting um, based on meeting these Balinese dancers who were brought to Paris in 1931, um, rather shockingly for the colonial uh, expo. Like people, they just brought people from all over the world to perform in Paris and actually the Surrealists boycotted it, but Artaud went um, and he just, that was his eureka moment because he just realized, oh my God, you know, we're watching these plays which are like light entertainment where people are talking to each other. But for the trained classical performer, there's this incredible language of gesture. And, you know, so like, the, and not just kind of like, posture and gesture, but even like to codifications of what you do with your eyes and your fingers. Um, it's related to, you know, for example, it's related to the mudras. Um, but as soon as you start to think about this possibility for the body and its movement in space in a way that tells the story on its own, you realize it's not without language. It's just that there's a different language that's being applied here, that the body has its own idiom and this is why, I mean, it's absolutely, you know, sort of fascinating because this is where you can make that connection back to architecture and architectural language and, and the communication possibilities that, that I don't think we've, you know, collectively exploited. Um, and I was lucky because thanks to Shirk, I went to Bali to, uh, to look at not only theater there, which was just mind blowing, but um, also the relationship between Balinese theater and the spaces that it's presented in, including, uh, you know, um, the villages, like, because it's, you know, at the level of ritual, it takes place across the entire space of village, um, the temples, and then the banjars where the same performers would do um, similar, similar plays um, for tourists, uh, but with this incredible, this incredibly rich, language and sort of mythic uh, poetics behind it. I'm gonna stop my uh, screen sharing and, and, and turn the question back to you, Lisa, um, about, you know, what is it for you? 
Great, thank you, Tracy. And I think mine will be a, a bit more um, anecdotal and personal, and I'll 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 go quickly. But I, I I think we'll return to the idea of the epiphany, the the satyr like epiphany that's that's received that's experienced in Artaud's Eureka. Um, but just anecdotally and, and personally, I mean, some of the interests began when I was doing my own uh, thesis, undergraduate thesis at Carleton University, you know, building dramatic thresholds here, enacting the micro event of passing through a doorway um, as, as something to, to break down and attempt to experience more, more fully. Uh, when I, I also have an urban experience, which is very important to my theatrical interests, which is living and working in New York City for several years, where my work experiences with Gaetano Pesce, who himself was a pretty dramatic character, but also the performativity of materials that he worked with. He's a glass maker and worked with uh, amazing wobbly resins. Everything is anthropomorphic, um, beautiful work, important experience for me but also experiencing the city and its inherent theatricality from you know high up the seeing the city as a work itself in constant transformation uh this is work i did with bone levine architects for a few years uh, on these swing stage scaffolds from some pretty remarkable uh, locations in the city and really, you, you know, participating in a drama, an epic drama, really, which is much larger than any one of its characters who are on stage, but for a brief moment of time, right, these these works are, are much bigger than any of us. So experiencing this theatricality of the whole city and feeling a, a very small part of it, uh, but a intimate witness. And then at the same time, going to see a lot of phenomenal theater. Um, thanks very much to my partner Ted Landrum who introduced me to a number of these performance groups but you know Richard Foreman's ontological theater Robert Wilson the Wooster group Ralph Lee the giant puppets and processions that's in uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine uh, and other groups including uh, Peter Brook um, Robert Lepage, Julie Tamar, William Kentridge, uh, and many more of these performances were very important. So going to see a lot of theater at the same time, doing some uh, exciting work experience in New York City. And then there was a particular uh, performance that we went to. Uh, it was uh, Ionesco's Chairs, directed by Complicité, a British group, uh, still going strong today, with a set design by the Brothers Quay. And it was this performance that just really blew me away in 1997. And I started to learn everything I could about the, the director, um, Simon McBurney and Complicité, going to see more of their work, Street of Crocodiles, an interpretation of staging Bruno Schultz, Mnemonic, uh, Noise of Time, staged together with the Emerson String Quartet. And discovering that, um, a certain school of, of um, movement and directorship uh, Simon McBurdy graduated from, led by Jacques Lecoq, whose book I devoured on the moving body. I, I started taking acting classes in New York City, uh, taught by a former performer in, with Moomin Shants. Uh, that's him inside the tube. <laughs> John Charles Murphy was the director of this course that I took at the New School for Social Research. It was actually in the fall of, of 2001. Uh, so just after the World Trade Center had collapsed, I, my cathartic <laughs> release was going to this acting class once a week um, and, and experiencing that transformation. Doing acting classes is something I have I did throughout my early PhD process. I don't know if you condone that or not, Alberto, but I did it anyway. And it helped me, it helped me um, kind of bring to life these ancient texts, which I was studying. So um, I did a course right away when I moved to Montreal in 2002 with the Ecole de Mime in Montreal. I did a class in Paris with Thomas Lebhart, who was a student of Etienne de Creux with Corporeal Mime, and also with the Complicité group in, in London. And this really helped me with the building up the historical imagination in my study of the ancient Greek plays. But it also helped me, you know, in going back to New York, like seeing what I was doing as an architect there um, and, and, and 
conjuring potential, helping others believe in something which wasn't present. And, you know, even though as architects, we make many things, we make drawings, models, specifications, we also arrive to places and with our bare hands, with our gestures, with our language, with our material imagination, we help ourselves and others believe in something which isn't there and to pursue this potential and also evaluate uh, potential. So throughout this process, I was also collaborating with uh, my partner, Ted Landrum, on various crazy, wacky uh, group costumes, which I won't go into all of the details, but uh, Tracy mentioned body parts. <laughs> and these were several body parts that we created, including giant tongues, you know, in order to taste the city better with the we, troops. We, these were performed in the New York City Halloween Parade. We made a giant brain made out of hula hoops. It was a kind of model of collective imagination. And then we've done various other performances uh, since then, including one at the Fiscari II Symposium, um, kind of enactment of uh, imaginative influences on our process, uh, looking at mask making and group masks. This was a concilia mask for three, um, which we created, which is a kind of reinterpretation of ancient masks uh, in ancient pant pantomime traditions, also embodying uh, certain body parts, including a model of Le Cabousier's open hand, you know, we were the winner at the storefront for art and architecture <laughs> Halloween competition. But you know, drama is some, it, it, there is an exaggeration, right? There's an exaggeration. We want to touch the world um, more profoundly. We want the world to be felt more palpably. You know, it was complete with handouts. We had paper, you know, with footnotes, fingertips. Uh, we were giant eyes, you know, talking about the wide-eyed experience. If, if you look at any um, at the vase paintings of Dionysus, there are there are wide eyes. There's something about the the shock and awe of this euphoric participation in the event. The talk about the event of understanding, um, but then of course going to the the study that I did through the dissertation. This was looking at the origins. And Alberto, I don't know if you remember, but when I came to you with all of these things that I was so excited about, your main question to me was, "Oh, Lisa, this is all very interesting, but where is this?" coming from. <laughs> so I just kept backing up and ended up in ancient Greece and discovered in these plays this very early references to architect figures which were not previously interpreted in the play of Cyclops by Euripides and Aristophanes' piece. And these are plays where the architect figure is, is leading a scheme of transformation for the common good in order to restore order. It's this reinsaturation of order that this figure uh, leads the chorus member and the audience members to participate in, to enact, and often the solution to this crisis is right under their nose, right there in the orchestra. It just needs to be envisioned and grasped in all of its strangeness and euphoria. Um, so these are some of the backstories for me, and I'll say that more recently, I'm very interested in the way that drama is being appropriated by some amazing directors, including Complicité, to, to manifest crises that confront us all today, including the climate crises, also Frederic Atuati and Bruno Latour staging moving earth and viral. And I'm also very interested in the in the drama of um, protest and uh, demonstration as a form of advocacy and participation. So I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we're already way over time, but Alexa, maybe if you have a follow up question for Tracy and I. I do. Um, so like with all with all the things you've said, um, I've kind of taken sort of things that would relate to sort of, um, I guess, like taking your met metaphors and and things like suspending disbelief and 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 sort of balancing multiple dramatic viewpoints but and then but in terms of motivations like what kind of satisfaction do you get when actually the thing you're trying to teach students they get you know like maybe describe something like that like well when do you know that oh my goodness they got it or maybe wow they, they took it way over to a point where I didn't expect but in a good way yeah, what a great question. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess that the, the, 
well, one of the pedagogical secrets is, is that there's nothing that we really want you to get. Like, I, I think it's when you transcend the expectations and, and help us learn that there is a, a kind of euphoria on our part. But Tracy, you, you, you might have, you will have something to say here. I think it's a good question. I mean, there's lots of moments and um, so, you know, it's not just like one thing, like the end of a play or the end of a production, but I think because, um, and Lisa also does the same thing. We both focus a lot on the process and rather than sort of seeing the thing as, you know, like as a product that we're going to like sell to the audience, um, that it gives an opportunity. And in here, I'm just gonna come back to, to this topic of, of collective intelligence and, and the importance of diversity. So we're super lucky because, you know, we have, um, you know, I, let me give you a, a, a picture just cause it's a nice picture. Um, you know, we this is what a team looks like, right? So uh, this is a team of people who all had a bunch of amazing ideas that were not like, meshed together at the beginning, but it's important to sort of understand that everybody comes with skills, uh, creative talents, um, like their own sort of backgrounds and histories and futures, right? And, and, and the strong sense of community that creates a kind of respect where people are supporting each other towards one goal that means success for the group. And this key, I think, is listening carefully to other people and to give them in giving them room. And what happens is you start to trust, you start to trust. It doesn't, you know, you can delegate some pieces that you're working on and you can trust them to somebody else without ever micromanaging them. And what happens is then you get this richness that comes out of multiple voices and diverse viewpoints. And like, wow, I would never have thought of that as a kind of a common thing, but but that's not just me saying it. It's like something will happen, whether it's a drawing on a chalkboard or an idea that somebody sort of blurts out or the way that a finish is working on a, you know, sort of an object that you're making in the shop. And suddenly, um, you know, there's this kind of, the, so, the, you know, these are like, you like little eureka moments that are populating um, the, the process all the time and we may even sort of start to tune them out but I learned so much from my students I think I learned more from my students than they learned from me but one of the things that we get is this communicative space that like the having the actual physical space to work and having this kind of diversity of like energies um, stuff begins to happen as soon as like you know as soon as there's something happening everybody kind of zones in on that energy and wants to participate in the energy. Um, so all this to say, like, like, to me, this is like the opposite of a system. It's not a system. It's like not even a formula or anything that you could sort of specifically, uh, you know, like you, you can't sort of replicate it in a way. It's just like being understanding. Um, it's, it's a little bit like what Murray Schaefer called the theater of confluence, where he's saying, you know, like, there are all these different, you know, it's almost like, it's, it's a bit like transmedia storytelling. There are all these different channels. Um, and so one of them rises and the others kind of dip a little bit like it, you know, like in, in music, when you're sort of thinking about how, how you hear certain things and, and at certain moments, um, you work basically towards points of confluence um, and how those confluences happen are sort of not, necessarily predicted in advance but but when people are attuned you know sort of working on different tasks in the project um like different organs in the body you know there's this uh there are these incredible uh moments of delight and and those are like just you know they're they're always like surprising and sometimes the surprise is kind of you know really materialized like our seesaw stage in Cora. like who would have thought that you would have these actors who needed to counterbalance each other very perfectly in order to not, you know, to, to crash. So, um, yeah, great question. Yeah, that was a great answer. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. 
that's great, Tracy. The, the, yeah, there's the collective experience of manifestation, and there's also the, the collective spectator experience, which I think is something we're, we're missing, of course, in, in this format. Yeah. Um, uh, and I also maybe one more thing, like I kind of also heard that you don't, you don't sort of judge what you're working on right now and kind of just let it flow. And then kind of in, I suppose, like, as you're letting it flow, you've kind of, you kind of zo zoom into like specific points and then you, you learn from those points, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. I think yeah. I mean, Tracy talked about listening in an improvisatory situation. You're, if, if everyone's commit it you're you're listening for those opportunities and there's these incredible moments when when groups are responsive to those opportunities and groups can you know it, it take turns in leadership i'm very much interested in the in the, the distribution of the of the arche of the sense of leadership being distributed among a plural body and this is something that's very much present in in the ancient theater that even though yeah there was a couple actors standing on stage on high boots they're the most important part of the theater really is the chorus, this plural body moving and dancing and singing in that open space of the orchestra, making present, you know, in a way it's a kind of uh, manifestation of the entire plural body of the assembly, assembled audience present there, and they are moving. And um, several of the, the acting classes that I participated in took the, the choral agency as the motive for improvisation, a kind of framework for improvisation where there wasn't one clear leader, but a dispersed agency. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I know that I, I have no more slides and I know that we have we've already touched on several of the topics that we want to cover so things like collective intelligence collective agency dramatic representation performing objects situational transformation we've touched on these already Tracy do you have a, a, a point you'd also you'd like to add with slides on one of these on the dramatic representation or performing objects I have a few more slides that I could just share some like quick ideas and but I, I also am mindful that we are nine minutes away from being done so maybe if somebody has some questions or put put your questions also in the chat if you have. Um, I'll just let me give let me uh, just share some slides here. Um, I was gonna just mention a couple of things that that we had discovered in terms of, you know, working in working in uh, landscapes. And I think that, you know, urban landscapes as well as natural landscapes or places where um, you can never quite control the whole process. So things are sort of much more open-ended in terms of like where you're going, like, again, like Alexa's question, um, you, do, you do kind of go with the flow. I mean, I do crit. What, what's happening in the process. It's it's definitely iterative. It's not like just like, it's not like, uh, you know, in, in one of Hodorowsky's movies where he would just get everybody uh, like into a big house and give them a lot of alcohol and then they would act. I mean, it's not quite like that. Um, there is, you know, there's, there's sort of special, special things. I was actually thinking about this when uh, Lisa was talking about her her, her body parts, um, because part of the Cyclops publicity was this giant um, inflatable eyeball, which uh, went for a look around the city of Cambridge and, and had its own events. I mean, it just kind of spontaneously attracted people to it because of um, what it was. And it was too big to go on the sidewalks so and people had to kind of walk down the street holding it. And, and so here we already have like the idea that things kind of spawn. Um, there's always these moments where like whatever's happening becomes uh, part of the kind of offstage process. And you realize that it's really permeable that we don't really like, we're not really thinking about this kind of separation of the audience and the proscenium. That's like a visual, it's a visual connection, but it's not a total separation. There's permeation. Um, and we had it again in, um, in Athru, um, where there's this moment where, uh, you know, so Gowan has cut off the head of the Green Knight, and then, and then he has to go back and, and after a year and uh, confront 
the green the green knight walks away with his head under his arm um and there he is with his like Chernunos horns. He's this, he's, you know, he's like a for he's a force of nature, basically. He's a he's a nature god. Um, and so Gowan faces up to the to the green knight in the uh, in the green chapel where he's agreed to come after a year. And um there's this beautiful moment when the students figured out how to make the green chapel appear around the green knight because he's walking out of the forest for a long time the reason he's luminous is so that the audience is like waiting as he's walking and walking through this path in the forest to arrive at the scene um and as he emerges into the glade the druids were each holding this huge tree branch which they found broken off i mean because it's a forest um they just raise them up and there's this moment where nature transforms into architecture. There's a very primal moment, kind of like putting on a mask and everything changes. Um, you know, and I think that these are, so again, this is maybe, this is just kind of part of this whole Eureka theme that we're, we're thinking about. Um, a few other things that maybe just like little, little details, like, um, you know, we'd been, we'd been asked about this, the difference between cinema and theater. And like one of the things about theater that's so important is your own, like as an audience member, your own physical body being present. This is something I really, I, I learned a lot from R. Murray Schaefer, but you know, uh, cinema is great and I love it, but it's really different because in dance and in drama, you hear the actors breathing. I like to hear them breathing. I like to see their muscles flexing and the gravity, like as you, you're doing things, as you're moving things and, and you make eye contact and you can, you, you know, you share the space, you walk around the set, you engage with the stuff. Um, so it's much closer to ritual. And it's not that I'm kind of fixed on ritual, but I think what's at stake is having an authentic experience. You know, it's like something that you can't really quantify. Um, and, and, you know, that reason, like how we like think about making spaces that facilitate human connection, that, that theater is such a, a, a wonderful medium. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, uh, Alixa and Sean, do you have another question for us? Or also Alberto and David, if you have a question, um, feel free to join. Chat. Yeah, we could come like the chat. <laughs> Let them up, <laughs> please. <laughs> There's one here. Um, yep. Samuel says, thanks so much for this wonderful conversation. Is there a tension in the plays um, between the experience of collective collaborative creation with the Daedalons, legendarily with the creations of master craftsmen, which are being celebrated in the stories, and how can that maybe help us challenge the architectural profession's reluctance to move away from the great man idea of design and into valuing collective creation and, uh, and design at work? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly in, in the place that I've studied, there is a, a usurping of the of the so-called great individual um, in a in the, the agency of the plural is is paramount. Um, and, and yet, you know, as Tracy said, it all just doesn't happen through a magical elixir. Um, there there is initiation there there is inauguration there is propitiation there is a, an utterance there is a gesture which which begins and without that beginning <clears throat> you know the the collective agency doesn't always come into fruition uh, so certainly in Aristophanes piece which I just love as an example you know there there is a protagonist but that protagonist is is nothing without the chorus and and once this individual realizes that that the situation is totally amok and if and if that individual does not act you know the the, the planet will collapse he, he calls for help he calls for help and then in comes this flood of the chorus members and those chorus members in this particular comedy is all 
all of the, the, the so-called outliers, it's all of the foreigners, it's all of the laborers, it's all of the farmers, everyone who does not typically have agency in the, the political democracy of ancient Greece comes to help this individual restore peace in the play. Um, yeah, through, well, well, there's a lot more to say on, on, on this, but um, yeah, the, now these are comedies, these are, these are exist, these are intended to upturn the, the status quo, and in fact, there was a kind of um, hierarchy in place that was difficult to usurp, but the plays allow for the imagination to, to overcome and to rethink the possibilities. Um, Tracy, did you want to add? there i was just going to say i think that's a beautiful way to speak about the restoration of order as being a collective enterprise that we're engaged in together um because i think we're we're basically out of time and i think that this has been a, a celebration of that kind of power and that kind of agency that we have um and and i again want to thank uh, Lisa, so much for putting this together because it's really been fun to talk about together. Yeah, it has been. Uh, thank you, Tracy. And David, I, I know that you've done so many projects in this area with, with Cooper Union. And if people on the call have not seen David's recent talk on the architectonics of curiosity, you should look it up and listen to it because these are similarly, well, at a larger scale, transformative for the students at Cooper, I know, uh, David. Well, look, I just want to thank, uh, thank you all. It's been incredible. I've, I, I loved it. Incredibly inspiring. Honestly, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, this is the hope of the future. And, and I don't, uh, I mean that uh, in the sense of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, trying to save the, uh, save architecture from itself, you know, the sort of emaciated uh, uh, state that it's become. Uh, which obviously the work you're doing is breathing uh, deep uh, oxygen into the discipline. But I would even uh, take it further than that because clearly you're working in, in all you know, in into consciousness when we get into questions of uh, 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 reenactment and recognition and and into the the, the profound uh, social uh, uh, political transformations that uh, theatricality uh, uh, bring about. Um, I, I thought of uh, a beautiful uh, couple of things. I mean, I took way too many notes. I'm never going to try to share all of them with you. But uh, John Haydock, of course, uh, a beautiful quote I thought of at least three times during this, where he says, there, there is the possibility of an architecture that could be understood as a fabrication. As it is constructed, it disappears. I mean, just... The, the, the subtlety of uh, gathering together uh, and the ineffable. Oh, and uh, I don't remember the question about outcomes. I thought that was really good. Not that I, I not that I enjoy it. You know, people are always asking me, oh, how do you measure the outcome? You know, blah blah blah. But uh, it's a really important uh, thing to wrestle with, and. Uh, I often talk, uh, I often point out that the students are the curriculum. There is no pre existing, right? The students are the curriculum. I, I work on a big uh, public school system, and, uh, and the idea that the neighborhood is the school, the students are the curriculum, the neighborhood is the school. And in that, but when I am ultimately, uh, I do think new spaces of education, which is clearly what you're both building in remarkable ways, um, they, they, they do need new um, outcome assessment. You know, I mean, in the end, we cannot expect, you know, we can't ask the same questions in the same ways uh, and expect different answers. We can't have the same outcome assessment and think, oh, oh you know, everything can be measured by those. And so I often end up saying, you know, the outcome, uh, ineffable beauty, that's the measure. Uh, it, you know, if something takes our breath away, then we've achieved it. And I actually think there are pragmatic arguments for that. I Meaning, I believe that the, the, there's, a, there's too much at stake to continue with the same 
forms of uh, known pragmatism. I think the pragmatisms of the poetic imagination, which is what you're wrestling with, what you're creating, uh, this is really what the world needs. So when I started by saying I'm incredibly hopeful from the work you're doing, it's, it actually is uh, architecture and beyond. I think that, that the crises we're facing, this is the work. This is literally the work that we need to, to respond to. So thank Fantastic. you. Alberto, it's so great to see you. It's just amazing to be here with you. Thank you very much, Lisa and Tracy. And I completely agree. It's extraordinary. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, David. And I, I just want to quote <laughs> Tracy Eve Winton from, from our Google document. Uh, Tracy says that architecture schools are not a great idea, but they're the best we have at the moment. <laughs> We're doing the best we can with some amazing students, including Alexa, Sean, uh, Max, Andrea, Saba, and others who are on the call. So thank you all for 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 contributing and and um, you know propelling this sunship of friendship forward. There's more work to do. Uh, if you're interested in one more Act Five of Arc Imagination, same time, same place, next Saturday with End of the West Collective, uh, going backstage with Janice. And I know David and Arts Letters and Numbers are launching exhibition openings this week, and there are there's more programming to come. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Thank you, David, very much, Alexa, Sean, and thank you, Tracy. It's beautiful. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks.